Welcome, everyone. My name is Becca Oliver. I'm the executive director at the Writers League of Texas. We're the largest literary arts organization in Texas, uh, putting on programming for writers all year round. Events like this one, virtual, some in person, a lot of virtual, a lot of great online classes, and a lot of free programs for writers. So our third Thursday event is something that we've been doing for 40 years since we started. And it happens, of course, the third Thursday of every month. It's a panel conversation with writers that we admire and always focused on a particular topic of interest to writers, whether you know it's of interest to you or not when you get to it. So we love doing third Thursday. And I just want to thank all of you um, for being here, for spending your evening with us. I want to say that you may notice there's only one other talking head on the screen right now, and that's because we're doing a little bit of a two-parter tonight for the second part of our two-part conversation. And that is because I'll tell you the truth. Once you're, when your book is publishing, when you're focused on that pub date, that's all there is in the world. But after a certain period of time, your life begins again. And so two of our authors who um, are on our panel tonight one of them is teaching a class that runs a little bit past our opening and is gonna be joining us at 7 p.m. And the other just did her first in-person author event. I think for the entire time her book has been out for six months, her first in-person author event and was flying back home. And of course her flight was delayed. So we'll also be joining us around 7 p.m. So we're taking advantage of that. And we're gonna talk, we're gonna do a little bit more of a deep dive with Stacey Swan into the timeline of publication date to today. And then we're gonna be joined by our two other guests, Alex McElroy and uh, Monica West to talk about a lot of stuff, to have a really great conversation. So welcome everyone. The first thing I wanna remind you is that if you haven't read these books yet, whew, you're missing out. So Book People is a wonderful independent bookstore here in Austin. We have all of these books available um, on a special page on the Book People website for the Writers League of Texas events. So I would encourage you, and I know, um, I'm sure Sloan will drop it in the chat box at some point. I think it's one of the links I forgot to share with Sloan, so she will find it <laughs> and drop it into the chat box. But it's a great way to support writers buying their books. So I would encourage you to check out all of these books if you haven't yet. And I'm going to go ahead and read the bios for our three guests so that we get those out of the way. And when Alex and Monica join us, we can hop into the conversation. Alex McElroy is, non, is a non-binary writer based in Brooklyn. Their first novel, The Atmospherians, was published by Atria in May 2021. Other writing appears in Vice, The Atlantic, Tin House, Tri-Quarterly, New England Review, and their first book, Daddy Issues, was published in 2017. Alex was rece has received fellowships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, the Tin House Summer Writing Workshop, the Suwannee Writers Conference, the Inprint Foundation, the Elizabeth George Foundation, and the National Parks Service. And next, with us here um, for this first part of our conversation, Stacey Swan's debut novel, Olympus, Texas, was published by Doubleday in May 2021. Her short stories have appeared in Epoch, Memorias, Versal, and other journals, and she is a contributing editor of American Short Fiction. She holds an MFA from Texas State University and was a Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. A native Texan, she splits her time between Austin and Limpasas. Welcome, Stacey. Hi, Becca. Lovely to be here. Good. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> We're glad you're here. And last but not least, joining us in a little bit um, for our conversation, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, Monica West received her BA from Duke University, her MA from New York University, and her MFA in fiction from the Iowa Writers Workshop, where she was a Rona Jaffe graduate fellow. She was a Southern Methodist University Cambilio Fellow in 2014, and she will be a Hedgebrook, or has maybe already been, a Hedgebrook writer in residence in 2021. Monica's debut novel, Revival Season, was published by Simon & Schuster in May 2021. All right, let's get rid of this screen. So, as I mentioned, for those of you just coming in, we're going to start out with a conversation with Stacey and I, um, really to establish the timeline, right? This, this conversation tonight 
is following an opening conversation we had in April, which was all about the road to publication. So we focused a lot on querying agents, on working with an agent, figuring out who you wanted to work with, on the editorial process, on the book deal, all the way up to um, our three guests being on the verge of publishing their debut novels. And so tonight, what we're focusing on is everything after that. And a lot of that is about um, marketing and promotion. It's about the sales. It's about the work that an author does and also the work that a publisher does to promote a book, right? It's about how your relationships change with your agent or your editor as the process moves forward because what they're doing and what they're working on for you changes. It's about things like subsidiary rights and all of these additional pieces of publishing a book that often um, we don't talk as much about. I'm actually really excited for this because I think there's so much attention given to the first part, right? How do I get published? But it's so nice, I think, to hear from three writers who are fresh off of it, still in it, you know, let's be serious. <laughs> it's been six months. Um, five months, but who have this perspective on what comes next after the publication. So Stacy, you and I are just going to talk for a little bit here before Monica and Alex join to establish kind of the timeline for folks, because I think some folks don't even really necessarily know what that looks like, right? What? So I would love to talk about what does the day before pub date look like? for a writer. <laughs> what does publication day look like? What is What are the things that are you know are gonna happen that day that you're looking for that day that's sort of being choreographed for that day? And then what happens the following week, the following month up to that point? You know, where does that timeline kind of end in terms of being going from being a lead and a focus title to being a book that has been published and is out. And there's sort of ongoing maintenance and work being done, but it's not the same as what, you know, those first few months or so look like, right? So no pressure, but to speak for all writers everywhere. <laughs> no, and it's, and it's great because I can, we can, work together on this because there may be things, you know, you just went through this, but I can't help but think that some of it's a blur, <laughs> you know? Yes, definitely. Yes. <laughs> so what about that, that maybe the day before, maybe the week before, what is that very short little window leading up to um, pub date, publication date? Your publication date was May 4th. I remember yeah. that because May yeah. the 4th be with you. Yes. <laughs> um, so that week prior to May 4th, what was that like? What was that for you? And what were the things that were happening that week? So there is, was not very much that happened. Like you have all of these moving parts with publicity and marketing that are coming together that you're doing work on in the, you know, like six months. Um, if not a little more leading up. So like writing essays that your publicist is trying to get placed and doing interviews with like print magazines that you hope winds up in their issues. And, but all of that is done, you know, by the time you're a week out, all that stuff is turned in. You have the, you know, and, and most of those are gonna go out post launch and the online stuff goes out like immediately post launch, a lot of it um, that first week. So it's kind of almost mental health wise, not a great thing because you are at your most kind of anxious and neurotic. And I know I was like, if I look at the whole period of like, just kind of nerves and anxiety, um, the only time mine was really bad was the week prior um, mm -hmm. and listening to other people talk on um, so the lovely little Slack group, which is where I have initially met Monica and Alex. Um, it's got mostly debut writers on it. And just in those conversations, I see it's true for a lot of writers. The, the week, two weeks before, you've just, you've waited so long for this moment. It is coming. There is nothing to do. There's nothing that can be done like that. You really don't feel like you have much control of anything because you're not having to accomplish any tasks. 
Um, and I surprisingly got like super anxious. And luckily by the time um, the actual pub day hit, and then there's so much to do all of a sudden, um, that sweeped all the nerves away other than, you know, the minor nerves before events, which were lessened because it was Zoom rather than in person. Um, but yeah, the week before was mostly me trying to calm myself down <laughs> and I meditated a lot more than I normally do. <laughs> that is our first great tip for the night. Everyone <laughs> find a meditation practice because you will put it to use, um, especially if you go through this process. So, okay. So then publication day. May 4th, you know, and, and you just alluded to this, there's so much that happens ahead of that, but then, and we'll circle back to some of those things. Cause we're going to focus on marketing and promotion as well. And we'll kind of go back to what was in the works that finally happened, but what, what is that day? That sort of very choreographed day usually, um, look like and you know we can talk in generalities but I also want you to you know you're gonna have you had a very specific experience yeah. so hearing you know what it was specifically for you as well would be you know in terms of the things that were happening yes I think mine was like felt even like I think it always feels really like celebratory and overwhelming and like there's a lot of stuff coming at you no matter what but because that was the same day that they did the Good Morning America announcement of the book club, right? So it, you know, 7.30 that morning um, and, and it's, they do like tape delays. So it had already happened an hour before in New York. Um, they had the piece where they announced my book and, you know, I hadn't been allowed to tell anybody prior to that. Um, so I think that upped the excitement level of it. I think I got a lot more like text messages and social media comments from friends going like, what you know, like <laughs> what? Well, you didn't tell me this. That's well, I'm angry at you. Not really. Nobody said they were angry at me. But um, um, so, so that for, those, for folks who don't know, Stacy's book was the May book club pick for Good Morning America. So, you know, one of our biggest morning shows, one of the big places where book clubs still exist in the world in a big way, media way, um, selected Olympus, Texas. And, and so the morning of the show, were you on the show on May 4th? Did you have to worry about that? Or was it more that you were, they announced it? You know, and that's, that's a good question because I already kind of forgotten that piece of it. So they announced it and I, I don't know if it was the week before, it might've trickled into that. So in the three weeks before May 4th, um, I had various video asks from Good Morning America um, all taped in my home, right? So I had to like write a kind of introduction, like, hello, my name is Stacey Swan and I'm so happy that uh, Olympus Texas has been selected. Um, and I had to do some other like weird stuff on Instagram, like boomerang and, <laughs> <laughs> they had a little list of things they wanted. So I'd had to kind of pre-tape all those, which takes a little while because you do many takes alone in your room with your cell phone trying to, to get it to work right. Um, so on that first day, they have like a tiny little intro um, and then they show a, a clip of me. So it's just like a two minute piece on the first day with Good Morning America. Um, and so like I got up um, cause I tend to sleep a little later in the morning. I get up at like seven 30 or eight. And so I woke up and opened my email and I already had a lot of lovely messages from my team at Doubleday and my agent, cause they had all been watching right around that time on the East coast, the announcement and, you know, what the graphics look like and, um, all of those things. So that was really fun to wake up first thing and get that. And then I had like 45 minutes until, um, I got to watch it on, on my TV, although I think by then it was also already available online. So, um, yeah. it's a weird thing of the internet. So then, okay. So you had a huge, huge publicity moment tied to your pub date and what, but, but there was other stuff happening as well, right? Like Doubleday had this big, um, huge reveal that they and GMA had the big reveal, but what about the other things that you're, you're kicking off on that pub date? And then the, the days after, like shortly thereafter, is that when a lot of, I assume other publicity was timed for, were there big reviews that people were waiting for? Um, yeah. What did that look like? Yes. And so my publicist was really amazing about always 
like keeping an eye on those things. So it's even prior to publication, because you get the early reviews from Publishers Weekly and Booklist and um, Kirkus. And she always had those right away when they were available. And then I just want to, I want to explain to people. So Publishers Weekly, if you don't know, Publishers Weekly, um, Library Journal, Kirkus, Booklist, these are trade publications. So they, you get pre-publication reviews there because booksellers read them, librarians read them, um, other reviewers read them to see what people are covering. And it's the kind of um, early sort of start to buzz from those reviews, but they're also really helpful for booksellers and librarians to decide what books they're going to buy. So so you had already, and I don't think we covered even that when we talked in April, so you had already had those kind of pre-pub reviews, and then it was more the more the general public reviews that were happening that week. Yes, and then the other kind of thing that felt important just as an author watching what what marketing and publicity was looking at was um, besides the Good Morning America book club thing, which we knew about well well in advance, um, like a few months before publication, the um, Indie Next list comes out from independent bookstores. And that seemed like a really big thing. Like you wanted your book to be one of the 15 books that independent booksellers around the country um, had said, this is a book to watch out for in May. Um, And so they were very excited that it it wound up on that list as well. Um, Yeah, and for people who go into indie bookstores, you know, you can find the Indie Next list there. So they're both a tool for other booksellers to see what books they should be excited about. Like, what are my fellow booksellers talking about? But then it's great for consumers who who go in and grab this little takeaway that lists books. And you had a glowing recommendation from book people in there, which was yes. beautiful. From Charlie. Yes. Very, very kind of Charlie. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And that, that felt really good too, because I, I have such a love for independent bookstores. So, um, and, and hand, they always tell you, right? Like the hand selling that goes on in independent bookstores where an actual customer is talking to an actual bookseller and the bookseller is making a specific personal recommendation, both based off what the customer is looking for, but also based off what that bookseller loves. Um, that those really do drive a lot of novel sales. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. So, okay. So reviews are happening that week. Um, you know, you're, are you going into your local bookstore to see if your book is on the shelf that week? <laughs> you know, COVID made everything harder, but I did like, I, um, a couple days before the launch, um, I book people asked if I would come in and do signing just some stock for them, sign um, book people actually very lovely. Um, they selected it as they have a first editions club, I believe is the name of it. Oh, that's right. Book yeah. Um, so subs- they have like, you know, uh, more than a hundred subscribers to that. So I personalized and scribed all those book books and um, was looking for it at the, and then I had to go back during the week of launch to book people and was looking for it on the front table, but I think I just happened to miss, it's wonderful. It was a moment when it was like sold out from the stack and they hadn't restocked yet. So I was like, where is my book? It is not here. But um, someone else sent me a picture later that day from book people. So it was just weird timing for me that I I didn't see it. Um, But- um, I'm glad you mentioned that though, because even whether, you know, obviously COVID has changed everything, um, but, that is a big part of that first week for a lot of authors is if you have independent bookstores in your vicinity, that's a great time for your publicist to set up times for you to go in and sign stock um, and just make sure that whether you're doing an event at that bookstore, your book is you know, front and center and somewhere that people are gonna find it because as soon as you sign it, they have that much more of an incentive to, and, a, and an even more, you know, um, a cool thing they can say with their little burst autographed edition to sell the book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, the other thing that was so helpful, so the just in terms of like how busy you feel and how packed your schedule might be, for me, it was really just like 10 days to two weeks that felt um, significantly busy. Um, but my publicist, um, and I assume all publicists do that, they give you like a document that has a schedule for you and it has like the dates of things 
um, what the contact information is with cell phone numbers, what's expected of you. Um, so that when you have in that first week, I would have some days that had, you know, maybe just like three things, but I've heard from other authors who had like maybe, you know, five to seven things on a single day if they're talking to different podcasts and interviews and maybe they have an event that night. Um, so that was really helpful. And she would update that constantly. Um, and, and those events were a mix of like what would have been bookstore events, but had to be virtual. So um, I did one with you and the Writers League um, that was book people oriented. And I had um, four or five others with independent bookstores. Um, and, and they learned early on in the pandemic that the traditional format of readings where you just read for 20 minutes or 30 minutes and then answer audience questions does not translate well to Zoom that people just kind of conk out. Um, so everything, um, unless probably if you're like a super famous, um, um, well-established author, there may be a few exceptions, but almost everyone that I see advertised is in conversation with another person. Um, and, and often there are other writers, um, but, but they might be um, other people as well. And um, so, so that was kind of the thread running through the first two weeks. One thing was those nighttime, mostly Zoom event, events of conversations, but then there were also um, like some interviews, like I was really lucky to have an NPR weekend interview with Scott Simon that was felt very surreal. <laughs> Someone <laughs> you're used to listening to on the radio is talking to you. Um, and, um, you know, and, and taping a couple of podcasts um, and, and other um, like Facebook live events. I did one with the author um, Adriana Trigliani. Trigiani, um, who has this great weekly show every Tuesday. She's doing, um, I think it's Tuesday, now I'm blanking out. Um, she interviews like three authors whose book came out that week um, or came out recently. Um, so there's a lot of like, public, it felt to me like publishing was very nimble with COVID and you know, thinking of different ways to get your name out in the world even though you weren't doing a traditional book tour. So then uh, to take a step back a little bit, I'm curious, you know, you were doing these events, these events came from, they originated through the publishing house, the publicist, right? Um, what did you know leading into them, what you would read from the novel? Did you read the same, if you read, I know that there were a lot of in conversations, but oftentimes they'll invite the writer to at least read some sort of portion. Um, did you, have an idea of how you were going to talk about your book. You know, at the last one of these events that we did in April, I invited each of you to um, give the pitch, right? The, the pitch before. And I'm wondering if you, if that had pretty much stayed the same for you, or if you started to see the way you talked about the book change as you were out in the world. It's one thing to be like, hey, friends, this is what my book is. <laughs> hey, agent and editor, this is how I talk about it. Did that change for you? You know, I do think it evolved. And what was really helpful was the ways you have to talk about the book in the months leading up to pub publication helped me kind of craft different ways of talking about it. So some of that was just answering interview questions, you know, from print, print publications. Um, and, and some of it was in the essays that I was writing that my public, you know, I brainstormed with my publicists and came up and, and I just kept having to write about the book and it helped me hone in on ways to talk about it. And then I noticed that I would then pull from those and all the, the conversations that I did. Um, and there was some, you know, everybody capped it at like three minute readings, maybe five minute readings, but there were some venues that said, we don't, we prefer if you don't read at all, if that's okay with you. Um, and, and so, um, so those, yeah, mostly it was me trying to find when I did read pieces that were only three minutes long, but felt like they conveyed a chunk of something. Um, right. so that was a, a different ask than you would have gotten pre COVID. <laughs> what was there a particular question that you were sick of by the end of your book tour where you thought, uh, someone asked me about. X one more time. I'm so over talking about this. No, I was I was almost relieved, right? When they're because sometimes people
people would let me know the questions they were going to ask ahead of time, but sometimes they wouldn't. And so when I got that, I felt like a nice softball question. I'm like, oh, I know how to answer this question of like, where did your idea for the novel come from? Um, I was just kind of relieved to have something that I didn't have to think deeply about. I did. It was interesting. Like I did one and this was maybe three weeks after publication. I did an interview um, for um, an, an NPR show out of North Texas called Think um, with Chris Boyd, although it wasn't Chris Boyd that, that interviewed me. And the journalist who was lovely, you know, she had read the book and she asked me questions I had never thought about before. They were really good questions about like- It's the called character. Think, Stacey. <laughs> yeah, thought very hard about them. And so those, I was like, it was that there's a particular skill, right? in being able to like begin talking while you're trying to plot out what it is you're, the answer you're aiming towards. Um, and I had not a ton of, like, I don't think I've had to do that since high school. And I did like impromptu speaking or whatever at speech tournaments. Um, so um, yeah, the, they're fun, but it's a different degree of difficulty when they're really interesting questions you've never thought about before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Marion is asking, and I would encourage anyone who has questions about this timeline, because I want to just establish it. And I think you're doing such a great job of showing us sort of how things unfold. Um, feel free to throw them in the chat box. But um, we're, so could you talk about the book club piece of it? So you joined us for our book club in June. How many book clubs would you say at this point you've done? Um, is it a big part of what you've been doing and has it been something that, you know, from your, do you get a sense that it's been, um, a valuable part of promoting the novel? You know, I, I assume so. And I, I know that like, even my agent, like believes like super firmly in book clubs and, um, pre-publication, the marketing team put together a book club guide um, that had like potential questions and now they put like recipes and um, um, playlists and all sorts of things, you know, um, for, for the book groups to look at. Um, and I noticed like in conversations on Instagram, people talking about it being selected for book clubs, but I have only, I, I don't get requests that often. Um, they were a little worried, like, oh, I'm not sure if you should just put your direct contact information on your website because you might just get overwhelmed, um, you know, and, and if you're not charging anything for the events, that's a lot of time to invest, you know, without payment. Um, but I think I've done maybe like six book clubs um, by now, and they're really fun, and I love to do them. Um, and, you know, because it's Zoom, it's very easy. I'm sure if they were in person, right, that's a, a bigger ask because um, that's a whole evening. Um, but, um, but yeah, so they, they've been great and I'm told that they are, um, really important, but I think a lot of people do their book clubs and they don't necessarily meet the author there because they're wanting to talk about your book <laughs> in positive and negative ways. Hello, Alex. <laughs> right. Hello, Alex. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I think I accidentally deleted my Zoom link. So I, I was just like knocking on the window of the YouTube. <laughs> to like um to get so, so kind um evan i'm guessing let you in yeah. um, <laughs> Thank you, evan. Yeah. well uh you are perfectly on time we are um just finishing a sort of opening piece with stacy and i because um we knew that you would be coming in a little after we started and Monica actually had a flight delay and is um, rushing, hopefully not too quickly, because I asked <laughs> Monica not to rush quickly to her office from the airport to, um, to hop in. So I think Monica will be joining us in the next five or 10 minutes, but um, I am going to ask Stacy one more question and then we're going to get into a bigger conversation um, because it came in over from YouTube, which is, and, and actually Alex, this is for you as well, because it's, we're talking right now about the timeline, the sort of what happens the week before publication, publication day, and then what is, what is that whole like choreographed period of time after publication day look like? And the question is with all the interviews and podcasts, did you find that you were saying the same things over and over again? How did you avoid that? And you were sort of touching on this, Stacey, but what did you learn about that as you kept going? Um, yeah, it was, you know, it's like sometimes I think I would pull out the exact same answers 
Uh, and then sometimes I would like, I, cause I've been thinking about it more and I would pop out something new, but you're always trying to like evaluate how those answers land as well. And so sometimes I would like change it up and think I was being really um, more interesting and then it wouldn't land as well. <laughs> it's like my first answer. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I don't think my load was not so overwhelming that I was in danger of boring myself to death. You know, it's like I had stuff, but I think if I was doing like five events every day for two weeks, that would have been much more difficult, but mine was much more spread out than that. And you did a great job on Good Morning America, I will say. We didn't oh. circle back to that, that you did have that finally on-air interview in a really beautiful location, I thought. Um, <laughs> and my backyard. Um, like backyard, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, my backyard did not look fit to go on that. <laughs> <laughs> and you nailed it. You nailed it. So um, yeah. that was definitely the weirdest, surrealist, most nerve wracking part of it was having. I thought that was all going to be on Zoom. All of the months prior to mine had been on Zoom. And then suddenly they're like, oh, there's going to be a film crew and they want to make you stand by cattle as they film it. And that, that was very difficult. And I was very glad when that was over. Carry and that bucket. Give me dreams of stardom to be on television. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Hilarious. All right. Well, I'm so glad you're here, Alex. Thank you um, as well for being a part of this. This is our first time, um, as I've mentioned to folks, doing you know a two-part conversation. And um, I'm so glad to have this chance to circle back five months later and you know, talk about um, five months post pub date, six months post the time we talked. So we're going to get into it. I know that Monica is going to be joining us, but I just want to keep us somewhat, you know, moving forward and on time. And then we'll, um, we'll get Monica in here when she's able to, but I wanted to, um, you know, so my first question, maybe a hard one, I probably should have given you a heads up, but uh, let's just go for it. So it's been five months since you published, right? Since each of your debuts published. So to start, I just wanted to ask you at this moment in time, looking back on the last several months, give us one or two words that encapsulate this experience, this experience from publication date to now. How would you describe it now with this sort of hindsight of looking back at it? Stacey, I'm going to make you go first because Alex just hopped in. We give them a little time <laughs> to think about it. <laughs> You're warmed up. <laughs> I, like the word that kept popping in my head the whole time was that it felt surreal. Like none of it felt, um, I don't know. It's just something it took me so long to write the book. I had been in the writing world so long so that when things kept happening, I was like, well, this doesn't feel real um, that I'm, you know, talking talking to these people that someone wants to have me on their podcast, like none of these things felt so surreal was the biggest thing, which didn't make it unenjoyable. Um, it just let, it made everything just have this air of kind of strangeness to me, um, which I hadn't necessarily expected. Yeah. All right. Surreal. Alex? Uh, I'll probably say humbling. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this, for like a lot of reasons. One, I mean, I... Um, the, the, I think, uh, William Gaddis says that, you know, calls it like the grand illusion of youth when you like, think like, I'm going to write the best book of all time. Right. And like, and of course, when you're releasing a book, you're like, like, I've done it. Like I did it. I wrote the best book of all time. And then like, you know, people have other stuff to do besides read the best book of all time. Um, and so like that, that is a moment that you're like, oh, like, you know, you can, I think when your pub day comes out, it's great to feel like, oh, like I'm, you know, the center of the universe. And it feels like really amazing. Um, and then suddenly you're not, which is a weird feeling. And I think it's like, it's humbling for, like, I like what Stacey was describing. Like, it's amazing and humbling that another person like comes to you and is like, hey, like I liked your book or like, hey, I'd like to talk to you more about it, which is really amazing. Um, but it's also humbling in that like, you know, you realize at a certain point, all you can do is go and write another one. Like, um, and you know, that is, that is a very strange experience of both feeling this constant sense of like gratitude for being here, but also 
needing to go do it again, um, which is a really, yeah, strange, strange yeah. place to be. Yeah. 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 It's, it's an emotional journey, right? I would imagine as so many things in life are, but um, Monica, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Sorry for being late. Becca knows the day I've had. So <laughs> Monica's had a day, but we're glad you're here and we are glad here. that you made it. Um, so you're just in time for the very first question for all three of you. And that was, um, you know, a softball um, since it's been five months since publication, publication date. Um, so to start, we're just, we're, I'm asking each of you to give one word that encapsulates the last five months. So if you're thinking, and I'll, and I'll give you the two words that came before. So Stacy said surreal mm -hmm. and Alex said humbling. Mm. I would say those are really great ones. I would say a little bit Oh, it's not one word, but like it's been a mix of, of excitement and terror. It's both things at the same time. Um, and so whatever that word is for the idea that it's so exciting to have a book out in the world. And then especially in the beginning of release, when reviews are coming out, like that's just really terrifying. And the book being public is terrifying. And so now I'm on the gratitude side. So maybe that's the word I'll use. Gratitude. I feel grateful. Um, yeah. for, for, I've been kind of threading that needle between excitement um, and fear kind of all the time, uh, like for, for most of this five months, but less now. <laughs> it's all it's, and, and who knows what your words would be in two weeks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, so, so we're going to jump in, um, and talk about, you know, that when the last time we talked, we were talking about, um, you were each shifting your time from that sort of all consuming, working on the manuscript, working on the manuscript, working on the manuscript to the time when it's really all about the finished, um, for lack of a better word, product, right? And it is a product at that point. It's inside a publishing house who is who has taken it on partly, of course, for the love of the work and partly because it's a business. So we're going to talk tonight more about the marketing, the promotion, the sales, that part of it, the sort of um, movement into um, the business part. So first for marketing and promotion, I wanted to ask each of you, you know, we hear a lot about uh, what a publisher might do to market and promote a book and what an author's responsibilities are going to be to public to publish and market a book. And I'm wondering if you could each just talk about that with regards to your own publication. What was the publisher, you know, responsible for? And what were you responsible for? And how did that go? <laughs> and were there any surprises? Were you surprised by what you were expected to do or even surprised by something the publisher did that you thought you would be taking on yourself? Um, what did that look like? And Alex, for this one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, I think it was a great example again of like how, um, how skewed my expectations were. I think there was part of me that was like, ah, like big book on a major press, like time for me to do nothing whatsoever, right? As if I would just be sort of like, you know, carried um, through the, but like, that's absolutely not true. Right. And like my publicists and my marketing team did an amazing job. Um, but again, there were so many books, right. And so it becomes like supremely difficult for like them to get the word out. Um, so I, I think I was a little bit surprised by just having to face the reality of how difficult it is to find space and that people, even people who are experts at this um, are like dealing with like how hard it is to like really carve out space. Um, something that I did and I was really fortunate because I um, really, I'm writing full time right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a lot of time and I used my book release as an opportunity to start freelance writing. Um, and I talked to my publicist a little bit about ideas and essentially like she had some contacts, but eventually they just couldn't get through. Like, you know, my pitches were a little off and at, at a certain point I just, 
wrote to some friends who were longtime freelancers and I sent them my pitches and I was like, hey, like, what's up with these? And they're like, you know, your idea is good, but your pitch is bad. Um, and so like, I talked to other people who could really help me out with that. And I think that that was really a game changer for me is because once I, I sort of really leaned into like first the publicity style essay of like creating some lists here and there. Um, but once I had enough bylines, I was able to just continue writing pieces, um, which was really important for me. It was a way to, you know, help pay rent to like get some extra money and also like, improve my byline. And it's weird for me to say that, like, I don't think it's, we talk a lot about like the fear of like the publicity essay, right? Like, you know, what is this thing that like, I will have to write. Um, but I really took that and kind of ran with it. And it's gotten to the point now where I'm no longer writing publicity essays. I'm just writing essays. Like, like, it's just sort of my job in the same way of like, anything else would be my job. And I feel really fortunate to have um, been, I think, quite literally strategic enough to like, use my book as an opportunity to move into a different style, or a different sort of writing world, which is like, you know, magazine writing, which is something that I had no experience in before. Um, I was mostly like, it's such a different, it's so weird. And like, I kind of love it. Like, you know, my entire life, I was like, I'm going to spend two years writing this essay. And then I'm going to send it to places who might not get back to me for nine months. Um, and now I can like send someone an email. And if they don't, I don't hear back from three days, I'm like, well, I guess I'm not writing that. And like, you know, like, um, you know, time is saved, like, I don't need to worry about it. Um, so I, I think I've, I've really enjoyed this process, but I also think that it's definitely not a writing style that is for everyone. And it's absolutely not something that was for me. If you would have talked to me a year ago, I never would have imagined that I was doing this style of writing. Um, so I've, I've just felt really excited to have like been, had an opportunity um, to carve out a different kind of career. What a cool perspective. I love that. I love that you brought that up too, because that is a part of, I think more and more even with review pages being cut and places where books are really being covered because they're books and they're being reviewed, um, publishers are looking for those, those essays and those other pieces that can potentially be placed. So I love that you took that and it became an opportunity for you to really like create this new space that you're excited about. Yeah, thank you. Super cool. Monica, what about you? What was that? What was that like? The publishers promotional efforts, your promotional efforts and kind of, you know, what you learned from that or surprises from that? Yeah, I think that was particularly hard for me. Because I find myself I think Stacy and I we were talking, I think we might might have mentioned this in the in the first session, but I'm pretty private. I don't exist in a world. I don't exist in a social media world. I mean, I consume social media. I don't, I'm not a big poster. I'm not a big, so the, the expectation in lots of ways to kind of put like always pub myself or advertise myself which feels really antithetical to who I am. And so I found myself wrestling with this idea of this is for the book and not for me. And and my whole life, it's been like, don't look at me, don't look at me. And now it's like, no, no, look at this book. Don't look at me. And that was a big shift. And that was a little bit challenging. And I think there were some expectations. I felt like in the, in the early days, I was, you know, posting and linking and sharing. And, and it was just, it was a lot. And it was a lot more than I normally do. And so it's so refreshing to hear, Alex, that you found a space of moving from the publicity essay, which feels a certain kind of way to kind of finding a really great space for yourself. Um, I did learn to kind of enjoy the publicity essay in some ways, certain ones, not all of them, but sometimes they gave me some space to think about something that I wouldn't have thought about. I think that the volume of them in the beginning was a lot. I mean, so like pre-pub is, is bananas. I think the kind of couple of weeks before pub, you're writing for this and this and this and this, and then you're also trying to manage your own emotions. And I think I wasn't expecting that. And I wasn't expecting the the way, the cascade of different expectations, plus how I was going to feel about it, plus how put on upon I felt. Um, but I did end up writing some things I was pretty proud of and some things that were kind of personal or um, other ways for people to access the book, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and I think, and then it's interesting kind of, and, and I think we talked about this, I think Alex, you'd mentioned this last time, which is being really creative with ways for publicity. Um, I think that um, there's like this big kind of 
sweep in the beginning. And then you kind of feel a little bit abandoned. You're like, wait, are we, you know, kind of like, there's that little of that feeling of kind of, hey, what is the rest of this? And is there more stuff? And kind of what I have found that I've been surprised by, not just the social media stuff, but the other ways I've been able to be strategic. Alex, I think you mentioned last time kind of working with an alumni association for, for a university and like looking at those angles that didn't feel traditional for me. And I've gotten a ton of stuff that way, doing book club stuff. Zoom allowed us to kind of be more strategic and more, um, and more intentional about that. And I think someone just asked in the chat, publicity essay is an essay that's sometimes connected to your book, sometimes about you, sometimes about the subject of your book, but it is, it's aligned to release right around the time that your book releases. So just kind of getting more words out about with your name on it, connecting to your book, that's kind of a different, different um, publications will have you do them. And so, um, or we'll publish them. I wrote a lot of reading lists about religion. I wrote a lot of reading lists about um, like gendered stuff and, you know, like all that kind of stuff. So connected to your book in some ways, but I think I was surprised by the different ways you could be creative and the different places that you could think through what it looks like to pub yourself. And then also not fully relying on your, I just had like, the reason I was late for this is I just had my first in-person reading in Baltimore that I flew back for and had a ridiculous delay in LA um, for like four hours um, when I should have been back here at noon. But um, that's something I created myself. That was not something that, I mean, I, I did this whole thing that I was going to be in Baltimore for this event. I had a friend who owns a bookstore, who knows someone who owns a bookstore. They're like, why don't we just make these two go together? And I just did that on my own. And so kind of finding ways to be really um, intentional and strategic and um, self-reliant because yeah, publicity will give you some stuff and then there's not every, they're not going to give you everything. And you kind of have to sometimes work, work through stuff on your own and work the channels on your own. And that's probably been the biggest thing I've learned. Right. And there's also that balance of the things that publicity says, you need to do these things. You need to write me four publicity essays yeah. by this date. Um, you need to do this with your social media. And then there's the part of it that is not necessarily expected of you or directed from a publisher, but it's sort of self-directed and right. self-created. And, um, and that's when it could be so helpful to have both, you know, a great agent who can talk mm -hmm. to you about that stuff, an editor, and then even friends who are writers who are doing that. Yeah. Um, Stacey, what about you? What was that balance like? What did that look like? Anything you want to add in terms of the you know, expectations you had going into it and what you found yourself ultimately being responsible for um, on the publicity, the promotion, marketing. Yeah, I feel like it's that thing, like when you look back in hindsight, I feel like I, like I was too concerned about like stepping on other people's jobs. Like this is their job and I don't want to tell them how to do their job because I wouldn't want someone telling me how to do my job. And I should have been thinking more along the lines of these people are all overworked and have a lot of different books and anything you can do um, is probably helpful to them. So like, I wish I had been more proactive, like here's a list of podcasts that I like and, you know, do you want to reach out to them or, or should I? Um, and, and here's like blogs that, that I like, you know, that, that maybe, you know, I can get placed at and, um, I think mine also, I wasn't really thinking about, they, of course, my book was like marketed in this way that they were trying to like market it both as commercial and literary, but a lot of the marketing and publicity landed on the commercial side. And, and those were not necessarily the markets I was as familiar with. And I wish that maybe if I had done more outreach, it could have had more of both. Um, um, and, and, you know, it's good to know. And then it's just all stuff I've put in my back pocket for the paperback launch, right? Like these are things um, that maybe I can talk about with my publicist for the paperback launch um, and, and do. But, you know, and the other thing too is just, which Alex had mentioned a bit about like the humility aspect of it. Like, it's just really humbling to see like what debut novel sales are. Um, and that even, you know, I had kind of the best case scenario of publicity um, with GMA and it still didn't mean, you know, that, that thousands upon thousands of people were buying the book. And so, so that's just, I feel like having, it would have been less bumpy if my expectations, you know, were more in line with just what the reality of, of publishing is. 
I mean, yeah, expectations and having um, real honest, you know, conversations and getting the information that you need from, and sometimes you just don't know the questions to ask, or, you know, if it's appropriate to say, how many copies should I expect to sell <laughs> if this, if this happens, but we are going to get into sales because, um, I want to add, yeah. add a couple things really oh, quick. Sure. If Go I ahead. Can. Yeah. Yeah. So th there were two things, um, that both Monica and Stacey were talking about one, um, there was this advice from Alexander Chi that I took pretty early in the process. Um, I saw him tweet one time, essentially say if you are writing a um, responses to an interview um, keep everything to one paragraph and if you say more than one paragraph it's a sign that you have an essay um, and I use that pretty much like to a T I was like oh if I'm saying more than one paragraph I should turn this into a longer piece and get paid for it because like you're not getting paid for interviews like interviews are like just publicity um so that was a really good piece of advice that i absolutely followed um another thing monica talking about um you know setting up you know her own readings like i started a reading series in brooklyn like my goal um was i you know, I wanted to have an outdoor reading for myself. And then I had it and I was like, oh, like there are other people in New York who haven't had a chance to have a reading. And I was like, I'll invite them. And inviting them, I was like, I can invite more people, you know? And so now we've just had our sixth event. Um, and that was actually last night um, called Debuts and Redos, which is people who either debuted during the pandemic um, or came out with maybe like their second book in the pandemic. Um, and are giving them a redo opportunity to actually have an in-person reading with like socially distanced and like more aired out places. Um, so anyway, that is, that feels too self-congratulatory. That's not what I'm trying to do, but I think like, I think that we're capable of way more than we think we are, right? Yeah. Like I think giving over to like the publicist must do this. Like when we can like, yeah. we, that's I think something that someone told me early on is like, we can send these emails ourselves. And oftentimes because they might receive so many emails from publicists. Um, we might even have a better chance of breaking through than our actual publicist does um, because our email is different from like, you know, what is like the template that a publicist normally has to use, right? Which is just, especially if you're only interacting with people over email, that can be so hard to just like, it might just seem repetitive or hard to like um, accept and take in, yeah. I, and but I love our publicists are great. I, I feel like I need to like like like, like oh, there are gonna, we'll talk that. about publicists yeah. in a minute, but but <laughs> I do but I do want to um I like I want to circle back to something that you just said, Alex, which is you know, you don't get paid for interviews, you get paid for essays. And I do think that can be a hard part of this process too, is when you let go of that idea that you need to do things for free to promote, to promote, to promote. And you start to say, no, actually this is what, you know, if you want me to write that blog post for you, if you want me to do these things, um, actually I'm, I'm a writer and I need to be paid for that service. So it can be hard to just to, to also on the other side of the publication, remember that, yeah, you, you are, you know, you're, you're an artist and a craft person and you should be paid for that as well. So um, I'm glad you're, you mentioned that. So I want to talk about sales because books are sold into a variety of accounts. Of course, there are the big chains like Barnes and Noble. Um, there are indie booksellers. There's Costco. There's Target. There's the airport stores. Um, there's Hallmark. I think there's still Hallmark stores. I'm not sure. But, um, but so there are special sales like that. There's Urban Outfitters you get the idea. So I'm just curious for each of you, I imagine you've had a crash course in what, where books can be sold and what that looks like. And I'm just curious um, what maybe was one thing that really surprised you about the sales part of this whole beast of publishing or what was one um, kind of unexpected piece of it, or just, you know, a sort of story about an outlet where you saw your book that you never thought you'd see your book in. Um, so in terms of where books are sold, what do you have? Monica, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, that's, I, I have something. I think one of the things I've been, I've always known, but it's the, this publishing a book has made me even more mindful about is that independent booksellers are the best things ever. Um, and so in terms of sales, 
I had, I was the first edition book pick for several independent bookstores. And so I had this really great, um, I was signing books for them. And I did with another event that I had that was supposed to be in person that ended up being on Zoom. A few of them were because of independent booksellers had read the book, were pubbing it on their own chains or pubbing it to their readers or putting it out in their newsletters. And that's something that I'm reminded about why buying from an independent bookseller matters um, and why going to kind of your, your local neighborhood place matters and supporting those places matters. Um, and then I also had an interesting kind of flip experience, which was um, my June of 2021, my book was the Barnes and Noble Discover pick of June. And so then the whole idea of kind of being in Barnes and Noble and having that kind of shift of, you know, your book being in this major outlet kind of nationally, and then your book being, and then the kind of tension between your book being and, you know, trying to pub, pub it in these smaller places, that kind of tension, what that kind of felt like to, I mean, a, I mean, in some ways a sale is a sale, but then in some ways some sales are better than others. I mean, like independent booksellers are better than buying from Amazon. And um, so it was this interesting thing of, I want to support these independent people. And I also was grateful that my book was on Amazon and that, no, sorry, my book was on uh, Barnes Noble in the, in the actual brick and mortar stores because that gave it a bigger audience. Um, so yeah, it was just sometimes the sale thing. And the other thing about sales is it is, huh, um, if you get too tied into sales, it's demoralizing for, you know, so the idea of kind of thinking only about if you, if you measure the success of a book, Stacey was just talking about this, if you measure success of a book by its sales, a debut novel by its sales. Some debut novels get really lucky, but, and they get these kind of, you know, but that's, that's the, that's the exception, not always the rule. And so um, I've just found myself grateful for Instagram bloggers and kind of just regular people reaching out or book clubs. And like those things have mattered to me and kind of um, because I can't focus too much on sales or on external metrics for what I feel like makes a book and makes something matter and makes it important. So I've tried my best to not think about sales. They matter, but I think I've just focused my energy on like, who is loving me? Who is putting my book up on their shelves? Where are they having these kind of book clubs? Where are my first editions pick and focusing my energy there? Less so on, you know, what number am I on such and such list, which is always, I think, gonna make you feel not always, but it's going to generally make, you know, if you measure your book with that kind of metric, that metric's not going to feel great for you, depending. I do think I, I, when I first started working in publishing, probably one of the biggest things that it made me think about, which I hadn't really thought about before is where people buy their books and, and how many different places. And at that time it was not, you know, Amazon was not what Amazon is today. Um, and you realize actually a lot of a lot of smaller communities don't have an independent bookstore. So people are driving to the borders mm -hmm. at the time, borders is gone, you know, down there. And that's what I um, am wondering, you know, as a new author, as someone who's published this debut novel and um, Stacey, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Like, what did you find surprises like that? Were you, did it shift the way you think about the way that books reach readers? Um, and was there a particular place that you found your book or that you were, someone took a picture of your book there and you thought, oh wow, my book is in Target. I forgot books are in Target. <laughs> I had a friend who was in Target um, with with um, her boyfriend's daughters and teenage daughters, and and they saw my book on display at Target. So she took a picture to send it to me, and she was like, she was like, the girls are so impressed because if you're in Target, it means you're like you're a real author and not just some strange friend of mine whose book I keep talking about. Um, but um, um, so yeah, I mean, it's it is really interesting, and I'll do like it's I understand why people buy from Amazon because it is cheaper and books are expensive and I completely understand that but I think maybe it helps when you're think we're such good you know we're trained in being consumers in America right and you're trained to bargain hunt and that is just how you think of being responsible in a way so like for me I've spent so much money on books this past year you know because I'm you know I know all these other great debut authors and so I've been buying as many books as I can and I think it helps to think of it, you know, that that you're not just buying the book, that you're supporting a culture 
that leads to a broader, more diverse literary community. Because if you just let the Amazon algorithms kind of dictate what pu gets published, it's going to flatten out a ton of the diversity in the books that you find. Um, and, 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 you know, people are devoted readers, and I know that they don't want that, right? People want to discover these great, strange books that they've never read before. Um, so, um, so, yeah, but other than that, I... I think the thing that surprised me the most that I took a lot of joy from and like the stressful kind of um, um, post-publication times is the Instagram, um, Bookstagram community, because these are, they, they even will comment it, um, amongst themselves, like certain areas of social media have real um, influencer cultures where people can really make a living of some sort being an influencer but for whatever reason like bookstagrammers don't really get that I'm sure there's a few that supplement their income with it so what you really have is a, a group of people who love to read um and they're doing all of this extra work like not out of of, of a desire for a career but because it's built this fun community that they like interacting with each other and so um I just, that was really lovely to me. It was lovely to, you know, to check for where I, you know, where somebody had put a hashtag Olympus Texas if I hadn't been tagged and just like write back, you know, to thank them. Like, like that, that felt like, oh, I'm like actually interacting with readers who, who've read my book. Um, and they're not, for whatever reason on, on like Twitter, right? Like on Instagram, people are much less likely to trash stuff. Um, so there's not like arguments within the comments when they, you know, sometimes they'll politely disagree like, oh, that book just wasn't for me. Um, but it felt like a safe space, whereas my Goodreads reviews didn't feel like a safe space to hang out in. Um, so it was just, it felt nice um, um, on Instagram and I hadn't expected that. Alex, what about you? Is there anything in this sort of world of where people are getting books, how they're finding out about books that surprised you and, um, delighted you or you know did not <laughs> yeah I mean what <sighs> I, yeah I mean I I don't know I mean it's I, I think Stacy and Monica have covered like most of it right like it's I think what was most exciting I mean I, I live in Brooklyn right now and I think time and again it was just like really cool to like go in and be like oh there's my book right and like in these places that and I think I, I like what you were saying Stacy like you know we're always like you know trying to chase like you know the deal and we're just sort of like um embedded in that world like that just like is American culture um but I think there's also something like American culture is also like, I feel like I'm about to sound like a bad politician. I was like, remember like, um, you know, American culture is also our neighbors. Um, but uh, oh, that's but I beautiful. Think, thank you. Yeah. Um, but there's something so special about like being able to like go into a store and be like, oh, like, here's this thing that I did that is contrib. I, I especially love like Stacey saying like you're contributing to this ecosystem, right? Like here's a space where I can look and I can see like my name near other people, right? Like, which is so exciting. I, I think Monica, you did an event with Kelsey McKinney recently, right? And like, what's so fun is I go into a bookstore and our books are so close to each other, yeah. right? And like, and so like, if I take a picture of like my book, I'm like taking one of Kelsey's too. Yeah. and and that's always like a really exciting thing is to be like who are my like feels like being in high school again and like who like my locker is next to like <laughs> and um and and that is like I don't know I mean something about that has just remains like really just magical um and so that's something I I hope to never get tired of um, I love that I love the idea of writers reaching out to each other just because like your book's right on the shelf next to mine mm -hmm. <laughs> our last names are very close to each other <laughs> let's be friends <laughs> I took a picture a friend of mine released a debut novel in Ma March and for the and I I was on the train I live in Oakland I was on the train into San Francisco last week and I saw someone reading her book in the wild and I was a little bit stalkery, but I took a picture of the spine and I zoomed in the pages and I sent it to her. I was like, look, your book, someone's, someone next to me on the train is reading your book. And I stopped short of actually talking to the person I didn't know, but 
it's, it's, it's such a community of support too, which is, you know, we're buying each other's books, we're propping each other up. I feel like that, that matters and it means something because we're all kind of in this special, this special community. So, so to shift gears from, uh, you know, the sales and the publishing experience here, you know, we focus so much on the book deal, the hardcover publication or the paperback publication, um, the life of the book in that way. But there's this whole world that you get introduced to when you're getting ready to be published or a published author called subsidiary rights. And it's your book in on audio, your book in large print, your book being sold to a German publisher, an Italian publisher, film and television rights. So I would love to just hear what that has looked like for each of you, if there's a particular part of that piece of publishing that also was either surprising or particularly delightful. I mean, there is, I worked for years selling foreign rights for authors' books at two different publishing houses, And there's just something really wonderful about sending an author, you know, the Korean translation of their novel, because you're like going to have that forever on your shelf and you may not ever read it yourself, but it's so freaking cool. Right. So um, what did what did that look like for you, Monica? I'll stick with you. What are subsidiary rights like for for revival season? I think so. What was interesting, and I didn't know, again, there are things that you just kind of learn on the job that you don't know beforehand. And so my book, when I, when I sold, when I sold it was sold in North America, like those are my rights. And so it's us and Canada, and that's where my book is being sold. And then my agency does kind of country by country. And so kind of this, this way of like, for me, it was kind of like, I don't know, people are saying, Oh, when can I buy it in the UK? I was like, not yet. And I don't know. And so like those are that's so that's some part of something that I feel like I don't have a ton of control over. But it's been interesting to kind of, you know, for people to decide what gets what gets sold where, what gets traction where, what gets a certain kind of, you know, foreign rights. Um, the audio story was really interesting about this book, which was, um, you know, people who kind of friends of mine saying, hey, did you read your audio book? And I was like, no, I got an email from my agent. Hmm two months before pub date saying here are four voices pick um and I said okay um and so I kind of picked a voice I really liked and then what's been kind of interesting is that she on my pub day kind of wrote some really generous email about I love I love reading this book and has kind of wrote, written some things out which has been really nice so that's been a kind of a nice non-connection I didn't know her at all before this whole process and um I feel like we have that kind of kinship now which feels really really cool do you have a shelf in your home with all of the different, you know, your audio book is there. Maybe there's a large print edition. I don't know. Are you, I have, are I have, have, a, sh- I have a shelf. Yeah. I have a shelf. Yeah. <laughs> you all have shelves. I don't even have to ask that question. It's ridiculous. Um, Alex, how about you? Subsidiary rights for you. What was that like? Yeah. I mean, maybe similar. I mean, we've only sold translation rights to Russia so far um so otherwise yes similarly my um this is how i know so much about american cultures because my book is mostly american Mm -hmm. it appears um and mostly available here uh so it's not something that i've like fully gone into yet um and again it's something that i am fairly outside of like you know if it were to happen it would be like oh like that's a cool thing and like um, I think the closest thing is like you know selling audiobook rights or something like that which is exciting um, and just like another way to um, help make back my advance um, and and those yeah. moments I think are are nice to have um, but it's something that would be like like a, a symbol sort of as you were saying, like, you know, it would be a nice object to keep, but it's not something where I'm really like at yet. And right. I also can't imagine like the Russian book is not going to come out like any day now, right? Like it takes a while to translate a book and then like publish it. So it's, um, so I feel like when it does happen, it'll surprise me. Well, and when you publish, you get a crash course also, or you get an understanding of what the international book publishing world looks like because you immediately learn 
oh, Germany will not publish this type. You know, Italy doesn't do this. France is obsessed with the American Civil War. Actually, <laughs> true. Yeah. So <laughs> if it's, you know, so these things that you never would have expected, um, you know, happen to connect your book to a, an international market. And then you find out more often than not, which is true, they're publishing books by their own writers. So often it can be really hard to get translation rights sold. Um, Stacey, what about you? I, I would love for you to, um, if you could speak to also just the film and television side of this, because I know you did have some stuff happening there. Yeah, it, you know, it was interesting. And I think some of this depends on agent to agent. And, and I just happen to have an agent who really enjoys selling those foreign rights, especially. Um, so like a lot of times in a book contract, I think like your main North American publisher will want to have subsidiary rights, you know, and and maybe, you know, bring that to other countries if they they have um, publishing arms in other countries. Um, but, but my agent keeps all those. So she was selling the foreign rights at the same time as the North American rights. Um, or trying to at least. Um, so all of that happened before. And then her, she has a sub agent that does the TV and film stuff. And that was also happening at the same time as it was going out, you know, for, to the, to the New York publishers. And I didn't realize that like people were selling stuff before it was even published. That all felt, felt surprising to me. Um, and it was interesting. Like, yeah, I, I, I never really thought about how every foreign country must have its own aesthetic and what they're interested in. So like France and Italy were interested in my novel, which is, you know, big and maybe, you know, it's, it's got like big emotions and lots of infidelity. Um, but like Northern Europe wanted nothing to do with it. Like I had no offers um, there. And like the, it did come out in the UK, but like my advance from that publisher was, you know, a thousand euros. It was um, on the small side, but still like so lovely just to have, oh, look, it's got a different cover. Um, and my Italian version has a different title and like, that's really fun, but it also does feel like it's going on, you know, and, and I'm not, I don't know, I'm, I don't feel fully in the loop of all things. So like it hasn't, I know mine hasn't come out in France yet. And I have no idea what the pub date of that is, is going to be. And then the only other recent post-publication thing that happened is there was a German publisher who was like on the fence about getting rights and so he asked my agent to get like a description of the novel I'm working on now thinking like will this be a writer that people want to read her next book and I wrote up the description and I sent it and then after the fact thought like well no German is gonna want it's a book about Texas politics and how Austin has changed as a city I do not think the people in Berlin need this you help know. <laughs> you never know I haven't heard anything back from that and then so the the film rights um like when they sent out I wound up having like a handful of conversation um, one with someone who was interested in it for, for a movie and then several that were interested in it for television. Um, and, and all the time my, my agent was like very comfortingly honest about these things, which is that like, you know, options rarely turn into finished products, you know, so just keep all that in mind. Um, so I, I, I wound up going with the movie offer and then, you know, 18 months passed, they had made no movement on it, but then they, they did opt to renew it for another year and a half. So at this point, I think of it as like, well, it's some free money in my pocket that I'm not doing anything for. And I'm trying not to attach it all to the idea that it, it will or won't get made into a movie. Um, so, but it's, it was weird and fun to talk to people on the phone. Um, and one, one interesting conversation with a TV producer was just an hour of me listening to her talk about her parents and how much my characters reminded her of her parents. So, <laughs> well, and you know, sometimes that it, when you get that deal, you've worked so hard on the book itself, you're, you're you know, bleeding and sweating into this amazing manuscript. And that's the thing that your friends and family really want to talk about. Oh, you got that film deal though. <laughs> Forget the thing that may never actually, yeah. you know, who knows? Um, I'm rooting for it because I <laughs> I have some ideas about casting. Um, so I did want to just, 
ask each of you, you know, there's this moment and I know that we're, we're, we're going on a little bit here. So I do want to start wrapping up, but um, there's, there's that wonderful build up to, you know, nerve wracking, but wonderful build up to publication. There's the publication, there's the everything, the hustle and the bustle. Someone asked, you know, do you clear your schedule? Did you clear your schedule for that? And I'm guessing that each of you really did. I mean, often writers, you have things you have to do, but you clear your schedule, you focus, your life is this moment, the rise. And then there's inevitably, you know, the kind of the crash, (laughs) because at some point, how can there not be right? Um, And I think it's an important thing, at least to touch on here, because it's also a reality of it, that there's times when you never feel more, you know, you never feel more energized and inspired, but then there's times where you suddenly feel like, where'd all those people go? And where that, like, where, where, where are all my Instagram likes? Right. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering if you, if you're, if you're comfortable with it, if you guys would touch on that a little bit, like how you've maneuvered yourself and what you've done to take care of yourself during this kind of big moment in your lives, but then also a big transition out of this moment. And I think Alex, you started it, you know, speaking about being humble. And I think this was a part of what you were talking about. Right. And, um, and also focusing on the next thing, um, and just continuing to be a writer. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Alex. Yeah. Um, so I think the most important thing a writer can do is listen to Olivia Rodrigo's good for you. Um, which is my publishing anthem when I like go back to a bookstore and it's just like, Oh, you moved on. Good for you. Um, (laughs) and, and which I realized I was like understood way too well after my book came out. Um, I do think, I mean, more seriously, like what has been most important, um, and, when people do ask me for advice is all I can say is make sure that there are people in your life who know you for more than your book. Um, And just that there are people who like, like you for who you are. Um, Because, you know, those just, it's been really important for me to be reminded that I'm far more than this book. Um, and that I have like a much greater life than like just this one publication. And that I think has been really vital for me. And those people have been so important um, just because like, it's a reminder that like writing a book is like a job, right? And, And which is great because like, you know, if you're like, a waiter, you're not going to be like, oh, like, this is my big meal that I'm serving. And then like, just like, sort of, you know, think about that meal for the rest of your life, right? You have to like, go back and hang out, you know, with your family and your friends again. So just, just having friends who are like outside of the writing world, who who knew you before family, like people like that have been, I think, really vital for um, just reminding myself that I'm way more than just this one book, no matter what sales end up looking like, no matter like, whatever, like, it's, that yeah. I think is really important. Really well said. Monica, do you have any thoughts on this moment? Yeah, I think what one thing about about law about pre-pub and pub was that the pace ended up being so, though it was exciting, it, it, that was unsustainable. The idea of kind of um there was something about those first couple weeks where the requirements for, you know. Um, linking something and sharing something and having events and doing this and doing this was actually really hard for me. And so I was, I was, though I was happy that there was the attention there, I was actually kind of grateful to be able to take a breath. Um, And so the fall being, you know, I think I've right now I've kind of like, I'll have something, I don't know, every couple of weeks or every, but, but it's like, it feels really different than it did in the beginning. And that has been like, the breath has been nice um, in, in some ways. So like not always thinking about the fall as being a bad thing, but the actual pace and the, the frenetic pace of that. Um, it's like, I, I never, I, I, I'm, I'm organized. I live by a calendar in general during pub, it's like, wait, I have this and this, I have these interviews here, I have this here, this here, this year. Like, this, this cannot be the way I live my life. Um, and so I was grateful to be able to kind of have time for me and have time back to writing and have time where I felt like a human being again, have dinners with people and stuff like that, that Alex is talking about, kind of have people around you that know you as more than a writer. Um, and then I think in terms of self-care, um, 
Yeah, I just was spending it, the, the things I couldn't, not couldn't do, but um, I don't know, just get, kind of getting back into things I kind of enjoy that I kind of got away from during pre-pub and pub where, um, so whether that's the writing or whether that's um, something else, kind of finding time to do the things that center me um, that for a little while, it's like, if I'm going, if I, if I'm on another zoom call, right. Cause it's, and it's also all zoom. So yeah. if I'm another zoom call again, four in a day, that thing, that was hard. And so I was kind of grateful to get a little bit away from my face being attached to this thing I'd done that the FaceTime is pretty, was pretty significant and, and challenging, but then, you know, having dinner with friends, uh, talking to students about your book and just seeing that kind of impact feels way different and way better for me than the public part. The, the one-on-one things for me have been really, really great. Stacy, what about you? Yeah, I mean, just to echo what Monica said, and I think it's probably true for a lot of writers because a lot of us are introverts, right? But like, it, I did not miss that frenetic period when it was gone because I'm like, oh, I get my life back, you know, and that that felt like a, a good thing and, and not a bad thing. So yeah, like there is, you know, a pang when you're like, oh, I'm not on display tables anymore. <laughs> like, hopefully I'm on the shelf in there somewhere. Um, I, my, <laughs> I had an aunt say to me, she had, it was like three months, four months after publication, and she was going to buy a copy of my book. She hadn't bought it yet. And she had called me on the phone and she was like, I can't find it anywhere in Barnes and Noble. It's not anywhere. And she was like, and then I had to ask for it. And I found it on an in cap back by mystery. And I'm like, oh, you yeah, know, thanks for telling me that, Aunt Nancy. Uh, but um, so, but on the whole, like, yeah, I doesn't, I'm happy to be back in the day-to-day, um, day-to-day life of it. So, so, and I, I mean, I think the thing is to, like, it took me a very, you know, 20 years of writing basically to get to that point. And I think there's that thing when you're working towards something for so long that it starts to feel as if it's going to like alter your life in some way, or will be the piece that makes you more satisfied with your life. Um, And, and it's just reinforced what I already knew that it, you know, it doesn't matter what city you move to or what new job you have, or whether your book comes out, your life is still your life. Right. And the things that make you happy, and content on a day-to-day basis are much smaller things um, than, than when a book comes out or not. I mean, it is very nice, right? And it opens up opportunities, um, um, but um, and I I'm, I'm never, never would not be grateful for those things. But, um, but yeah, it's, you know, my life feels normal again and, and that's all right. Yeah. You guys all have a very healthy perspective on this. <laughs> <laughs> I applaud you each. How has the Virgo been doing? Alex, I was watching, (laughs) I was watching the April video and I said, I have to ask Alex about their Virgo, like (laughs) survival through. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How did I do it? I mean, I, I, I should, maybe I should be upfront that I'm a Leo cusp. So uh, like, oh, yeah, no. yeah. So, so that, yeah, I'm, <laughs> so I'm a fraud, what I'm saying. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's been, uh, you know, it's been, I, I'm actually extremely, I'm like weirdly disorganized. I go through like organizational binges um, where like I'll spend like, you know, figure everything out really quickly. But like, as for, I think I've been fine, you know, like I have not had, I I will say like something that was really important to me is like, I sort of put it in my head that like, I am going to do everything I can possibly do for this book. And I feel like I have, like, I, like if my book doesn't sell, it's like, well, I guess it wasn't going to (laughs) sell. Like, you know, because I've, I've hustled pretty hard for it. And like that, I think is like a good feeling at the end, which like is very sports metaphor. Like we put it all on the line, but like, it's, it feels pretty true. Like I, now I know like whatever my sales are, it's not because I didn't do something. Um, It's just like, maybe it wasn't the right time for this book to be in the world or whatever thing Um, or whatever, you know, pandemic um might be like affecting sales and stuff like that um but I've I feel pretty good about the work that I've put in and making this book happen well and I think that's a a great 
sort of note to end on that, that, and from everything that, you know, certainly I've been lucky enough to see as someone who was thrilled by the way, to have each of you be a part of our book club and that not only have you done a lot of hard work, but you've also, your books are out there and people are talking about them and they are being featured in places and they are still being talked about and still being featured. And it's just super cool. So I want to go back to the way we started the April, 2021, um, panel, which was just saying to each of you, congratulations. You know, this moment is still such a cool, cool moment. And I hope you're all, and it sounds like you are still, you know, taking it in and, and, and being so just really proud of yourselves because it's, it's amazing. It's a really great accomplishment. So thank you so much for being, uh, so for agreeing to be a part of both of these panels, for doing the book club and for just spending um, your time with us this evening, because I know life is back and there are things to be done. So, and thank you to everyone who's been listening for being a part of this. Um, I hope you'll go back and watch the first uh, April, third Thursday, if you haven't, and hear these folks talk a lot about the lead up to publication. Join us at our next event and just have a, have a great night and go buy some books, buy these books at Book People, support your indie bookstores and support authors. Yeah. Thanks, Thank everyone. you so much, Becca. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Becca. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Stacey. Oh, so nice yeah. to see y'all. Nice to see you, too. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank Bye. You. Until the next books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Good night. Bye. Good night.